This is a Vault Studios production. I'm Reed Redmond. I'm Spencer Brudig. I'm Will Johnson. This show contains graphic material and is meant for mature audiences. This week on True Crime Chronicles. I have to stand strong. This is bigger than me. This is uh, bigger than my son. This is this is worldwide. You know, this is going on. These tragedies are happening all over the world. You can imagine a Friday night in Sacramento, California, a high school football game. <laughs> Cheering parents, excited fans, players racing on and off the field. All that good stuff we associate with sports and schools and rivalries. But this game is different. One of the teams here is missing its star quarterback, J.J. Clavo. And so J.J. was on the football team. Um, you saw the impact just from that game. It was emotional not only on his side, his teammates, but also even the opposing team. J.J.'s favorite color was red. You saw on both sides they were wearing red in memory of him. All week I've been just thinking about today. You know, he plays on my side. We both on that right side. We hold it down. So today, it was just a struggle, but we came through. He's not replaceable. I mean, but we worked what we had, and we know that he was here with us spiritually, so, we, so he went too far. Four days earlier, Grant Union High School lost its quarterback, 17-year-old J.J. Clavo, and a mother lost her son. But Dr. Nicole Clavo wasn't going to miss this game. This is what my son loved to do. This is where his joy and his happiness came from. So I will be here every week. I will be at every game. Not just this season, but the next season as well. I still have babies out here that I have to support. I supported him when he was here, and I'm going to continue to support him now that he's gone. A mother in the early days of losing her only son. A son who died suddenly and violently. ABC 10 investigative reporter Ananda Rachita. It was November 13, 2015. JJ and four of his teammates were coming back from getting food at Popeye's, and they were headed back to a CIF football game and coming back to a team meeting. They were stopped at a three-way stop sign, and a young man walked up to the car, shot into the passenger side of the car. JJ was a driver. JJ was hit in the neck, the chest, and his fingertips were blown off. The passenger where he was, he was supposed to be shot, well, the passenger where that was targeted, he survived. JJ did not. I mean, honestly, to put it, he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. He was driving his teammates just to go to Popeye's and came back, and that's when everything happened. The shooting, J.J.'s murder, appeared to go unsolved for months. But behind the scenes, police had a suspect in custody. So Kimonte Lindsay, he was 15 at the time. He was arrested the day after the shooting, and it was because of a traffic stop. A weapon was found at his feet. He was booked into juvenile hall on a weapons charge. But it wasn't until months later that we heard about the arrest because the investigation later found out that the gun that was found during that traffic stop was actually connected to the shooting that killed J.J. This happened in November. The shooting happened in November, and we were told of the arrest by police in February. It's been just over three months since that tragic shooting happened near Grant Union High School. Today, police announced they've had a suspect in custody ever since the day after after the shooting, 16-year-old Kimonte Lindsay was pulled over for a traffic stop. Police found a gun on him, and he's been in the Sacramento County Juvenile Hall ever since that day on a separate weapons charge. It wasn't until this morning did police have enough evidence to charge Lindsay with JJ's murder. My emotions were all over the place. Um, it's kind of hard to describe how I was actually feeling. You know, it was a sigh of relief. A sigh of relief that police say her son's killer has finally been caught, but also sadness and empathy for another family who has lost their son. His mother, his grandparents, whomever, his family in their entirety may still have a son or grandson. In, in the physical sense. While in her darkest times, Dr. Clavo says there's been one thing that has kept her strong, her community. They have been just such a wealth of support. Um, and without them, I don't think I could have maintained the strength I've been able to maintain. Lindsay was younger than J.J. Clavo, and according to his mom, couldn't have pulled the trigger. She said he was a very quiet kid. He got along with everyone. His mom was convinced, and even when he was convicted, that he was not part of the shooting whatsoever. Um, she said it was there was just not enough evidence to even convict him. She said it's, it was not even possible. Despite her claims, it appeared Lindsay was the only likely suspect. But it took years for J.J.'s killer to get justice. If he was an adult, he could have served, received life in prison. But um, this all happened over the course of Senate Bill 1391. So our former governor, Jerry Brown, he signed us into, a, into law in 2018, and this shooting happened in 2015. So Lindsay could not be charged as an adult because of his age at the time the crime was committed. So he was 15 at the time. And under that SB 1391, the longest the juvenile justice system is allowed to hold minors is up to the age of 23. Finally, after years of bouncing around from the juvenile system to adult courts and back again, Kimonte Lindsay was found guilty. A teenager accused of killing a Grant High School student has been found guilty of murder. Back in 2015, Kamonte Lindsay shot and killed J.J. Clavo while Clavo and his football teammates were on their way back to Grand High School for a playoff game. Lindsay was 15 at the time. Now he's 18 years old, and he's bounced back and forth between adult and juvenile court. I have fought for him to be tried as an adult. I do not believe that um, he should get off of all the charges he's facing and only have to do a limited amount of time. I don't think our system is created to truly rehabilitate in the short amount of time he will serve. Lindsay was sentenced for the murder of J.J. Clavo, but charged now as a juvenile. The final sentencing was murky. We heard that he may only get four years, um, but it was still unclear towards the end the length of his sentencing because that had yet to be determined by the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. It was outside one of the many hearings over those years, in the weeks before Lindsay was sentenced, 
The cameras captured a scene that captivated viewers, a scene that might have seemed strange, hard to believe. And we want to show you this really powerful moment. It's going to be there on your screen in just a moment. The mom of the victim and the mom of the killer hug and pray before the hearing. The two women on opposite sides of this tragedy sharing their grief and support. And the suspect is set to be sentenced in two weeks. Really powerful moment there. And along the way, J.J.'s mom, Dr. Nicole Clavo, started getting the attention of reporters and the media. It probably wouldn't be a surprise to anyone who knows her, but there was a sense that in all of this tragedy, a young man killed in the prime of his life, another spending half of his teenage life now behind bars, something brighter had emerged, a voice of strength and resilience. All the children that have been affected by this event, all the adults that have been affected by this event, I pull my strength from them because they're hurt, they're destroyed, um, their lives are forever impacted just as mine will be. We can't change until we all change and take accountability for the growth of our youth and to learn that it takes a village to raise a child. We have to get back to that day of age where we're all holding the children in our communities and in our neighborhoods accountable for their actions. We just need to say how much we admire the strength of JJ's mother. She yes. was so eloquent today at the news conference with police and then in your interview and that if anybody can be an advocate to change and stop the senseless violence, she can do it. She's an incredible woman. All right. Thank you. Dr. Clavo, I first met her um, like right when everything kind of happened. Um, but Dr. Clavo has been so vocal. Um, she's definitely turned her grief into advocacy. Um, she had a scholarship named in memory of her son for high school student athletes like her, uh, her son. It's called the J.J. Clavo Scholarship Fund. Um, she also created a community summer program at the Robertson Community Center, which was just a block away from where her son was killed. So it gives teens something to do on Thursday, Friday, and Saturdays during the summer. Um, there's arts and crafts, games, an area where kids can even learn about their finances. And for her, this is a safe haven for kids during the summer when they're out of school. My son was not the first child killed in this type of tragic shooting, but there will be more children, and we have to stop it. My baby was a happy baby. He was always had a smile on his face. He was always smiling. We all need to do that. Across so many in many episodes of this show, we've told you about the victims of violence, and we've told you the stories of families of victims, families still looking for a killer, still wondering what led up to a brother, a sister, a husband, a wife, simply disappear. But Dr. Nicole Clavo knows what happened to JJ. She knows who killed him. And today, in 2021, she's still fighting for change and helping others get through a pain most of us can't even imagine. I am the founder, co-founder of the Healing Five organization that work with families um, that have experienced trauma. Um, violence in their lives um, and different things in that nature, families, children, loved ones. And as well, I am officially the ma uh, manager director of the Office of Violence Prevention here in Sacramento for the city. Have both of those positions come about since the death of your son? Yes. Um, Healing Five was founded uh, on behalf of my son. My daughter and I co-founded the foundation, and that was out of um, this amount of support that we have received from the city, surrounding city, the communities, uh, people from far and near, and we felt the need to have to um, be able to provide that type of support back because it was not the normal. Do most people, when they come to work with you or you work with them, know your story? Most people know my story. Um, it was a pretty big story. It was on every news network, um, hit some national um, spots as well. And so m most people in the county uh, know my story. What does it mean to you today to be doing what you're doing? I've read, I've read about you over the past week, and I've watched interviews and videos, and you know, I have a sense of, of why this matters so much. But in your own words, what does it mean to do what you do now? It's personal. It, you know, it's personal, and I feel I'm doing the work in honor and um, for of my son. The um, once again, the amount of support that I received was overwhelming. I would have one never imagined losing my son in that way, but two never imagined receiving that that type of support, support from law enforcement, support from congresswomen, you know, uh, support from community members, schools, principals, teachers, moms, dads, um, kids, and so I just felt compelled to have to return that. I felt like I owed the community something in return for all the love. Uh, it's been five years. It's been five years, two months, and that love still pours into me. I'm still supported in the same way that I was supported on November 13th of 2015. And every family, every mom, every individual impacted by violence and trauma does not receive that, that, that same amount of support if they receive any. And so I just felt that it was my purpose, that it was the plan. I'm spiritual. I believe that, you know, God chose, you know, my son to kind of lay – um, create change, help to create change in our communities, and help to create change in how we support one another and how we love and, 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 and give back. And so Healing Five has been that. 
you know, it has been that outlet for me. It has kept me moving. It has allowed me to heal, and it's allowed me to bring healing to others. Can you talk just a little bit, and I know it's probably a longer conversation, but touch on just some of the differences that families go through when they're touched by uh, lo- losing someone in a violent manner, not just, you know, a sickness or some, you know, something happens, but when violence is involved, as with your son, what are some of the differences and, and unique situations that people are put in? You know, automatically, you're kind of put into the boat. The first question when someone's lost to gun violence is, oh, well, our statement is, oh, it was gang related. Or, you know, um, they put you in this, this, this box. And, you know, oh, that you live by the sword, you die by the sword, or, you know, they probably probably brought it on themselves. So at first you're hit with a lot of negativity, right, until, you know, you, you speak up or not speak up. In the past, mothers, families, whomever, were, were not speaking up. And so for, I think, in my situation, I was one of the first to really, you know, take control of the media and speak and create my narrative and not allow media to create a narrative for me. And um, I almost didn't take that opportunity until I thought about it. And I was like, well, let me speak because I had denied access to the media initially. And being able to, you know, those who come forward and, you know, speak on behalf of my son, as well as me knowing my son, was able to start a a trend of moms now speaking up for their loved ones. Um, And then, you know, there's a lot of comparison. You know, uh, I've had news outlets come into my home when my son was first killed and said, well, it's different for you. You live in this house. You're a doctor. You do this. You do. You have a good job. It's not different. It's not different for me because as any other mother, no matter where you live or your socioeconomic status, you've still lost a child that you birth. And no parent should have to bury their child. We shouldn't outlive our children. And so the pain isn't different because I live in, in the county versus the city limits or I live in this my neighborhood versus another neighborhood. That, that should never be a comparison. It was seemed like a, a big deal that moment when you hugged the mother of Camonte Lense. Did you have any idea at the time what sort of that might represent or that it would get the spotlight that it seemed to have gotten at the time? The hug was totally um, unexpected. Um, but received, whether it was sincere on her her behalf or not, it was sincere on mine. And w- w- at what point in the proceedings or the trial did that did that happen? It happened on the, the day of the arraignment, which was the first time. And um, she kind of initiated that and had no idea. And then when we went uh, to court for the um, the final day of court, I actually prayed with her. I asked one of the bishops, Bishop uh, Lovelace was there in support of me, and I just grabbed his hand and walked over to her and asked him to pray with us. You know, despite the outcome, she was losing her son to the system. I lost mine to the graveyard. Um, and I just want that family to take the gift they've been given of life in the um, knowing that he will be home in, a ne- in the next year or so and take that gift that they've received and do, do the most with it. You know, do do with it what my son will never have the opportunity to do with time and life. And so I hope they heard me. And so part of, you know, that hug and that praying with her on that final day of court was, you know, me giving um, strength to myself and giving, you know, acknowledgement to my faith and um, just praying that her and her child um make the most of this time. And they both grow from the situation and change. And that scene of forgiveness from years ago, the mother of a murdered son hugging the mother of his killer, it represents what Dr. Clavo holds on to, her own need to forgive and to continue to forgive. It's, it's, and it's always for us. It's really, it's, it's for me, right? That forgiveness is for me. It's not for her. It's for me. Because when we don't forgive, then it, it ferments in our soul. And you stay angry and animosity and anxiety and all of those things, those emotions build within you. And it really stops your progress. You can't move forward if you're stuck in the past. And so don't forget, but forgiving is a huge part of healing. And does that mean forgiving Kamonte Lindsay too? Yes. Yes. Um, that's, the, that's the bigger part is having to forgive him for pulling that trigger on that day um, and taking my son's life, you know, um, and injuring Malik, the other young man that was in the car, you know, and the trauma that he's caused with those young men, the silent trauma that they're enduring every day of their life because they are holding in their young men and they don't know how to communicate or express 
the pain and the trauma that is still haunting them today. They, their best friend, someone they called their brother, their teammate, um, the passenger lived with me. And so the one that got shot in the arm, Malik Johnson, lived with me during that time. So he was my family. He was my bonus son. And so the trauma that is that he has to live with every day, sitting next to his best friend, his brother, being murdered and watching that all play out, that's what's not spoken. We don't speak about it. That trauma that these young men, that these four young men still live with today, that and now that they're young adults, they're 22, 23 years old, we don't speak about the experience that they had at the age of 17 and what it's like living with today. She had a life and someone took that away. 31 years hunting for her mom's killer. And it's going to end with me getting the person that killed my mom. Pune Gray is closer than ever. So these are dangerous people. Extremely dangerous people. From the team that brought you Urge to Kill, I'm Ashley Korsland. Are you willing to go to war, so to speak? And this is The Yellow Car. I'm always ready for anything. Subscribe now. And I'm back with Reed Redmond and Spencer Brudig. And, you know, you listen to this story about J.J. Clavo, and there's this awful tragedy of a young man killed violently. But what I hope and what I imagine listeners will take away from this is this voice and the strength and resiliency of Dr. Nicole Clavo. Yeah, well, I looked a little bit more into the nonprofit she started, the Healing Five Foundation. And and one thing that I thought was noteworthy about it is according to the website, it's not just for victims or families of victims of violent crime. They actually provide grief support for victims of all kinds of tragedies, including illness, domestic violence, motor vehicle accidents, suicide, murder, and other unforeseen circumstances. And and it looks like those services are available 24-7 to anyone who needs them on the Healing Five Foundation's website. Yeah, there's really been a lot of community building in the wake of this tragedy. Uh, I mean, scholarships, community center, the Healing Five organization. And actually in August of 2020, Dr. Clavo was announced to be the head of a new gang prevention and intervention department for Sacramento. So she has a huge impact on the city, you know, since her son was killed through this. And hearing her speak too, it's clear just how big of a loss this is to the whole community, obviously to the immediate family. And it's, it's really tough to hear her talk about all these things that her son, JJ, doesn't get to do now. And it really seems so senseless. I mean, you, you mentioned that he wasn't even the target of the shooting. The, the shooter was trying to hit somebody else in the vehicle, right? Yeah, you know, and I actually have some of the uh, actual language from this case from the city of Sacramento. Clavo was driving to Grand High School, as we mentioned, with four of his friends in the car. They came to a stop at an intersection. An armed suspect walked up to the car, fired five rounds into the passenger side. So it goes on to say, quote, J.J. and his front seat passenger were both struck by gunfire in a panic. The remaining passengers moved J.J. to the back seat and drove him to Grand High School seeking medical assistance. And as I mentioned, and also Dr. Nicole Clavo mentions, uh, the front passenger sustained a gunshot wound to the arm that was non-life-threatening. So as with so many of our stories, a lot of lives affected, in this case, so many young lives. Thanks again to Dr. Nicole Clavo for talking to us. We'll be back next week with uh, another story. In the meantime, Spencer, where can people go to learn more about True Crime Chronicles and talk about the cases that we cover? Right. We have a a group with well over 5,000 people now called Inside the Crime Vault on Facebook. So uh, check us out and connect with us on that. And Reed Redmond will be back next week with a story that you are working on out of uh, Houston, Texas, right? That is right. They've had a a really interesting story that's taken quite a few turns over just the past week now. And for True Crime Chronicles, along with Spencer Brudig and Reed Redmond, I'm Will Johnson.